The Environmental Protection Agency has been basically captured by the pesticide industry. It's shocking, it's horrifying, and it's affecting all of our lives. Check this out. Leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. On the line with us is Dr. Nathan Donnelly. He is the senior scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity. Biologicaldiversity.org is, uh, is the website. And uh, they've just issued an a absolutely startling report about what the EPA is up to with regard to some of these pesticides. Dr. Donnelly, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, tell us what's going on with this. The, the headline, Trump EPA approves 100 plus products with pesticides banned elsewhere or slated for U.S. phase out. Yeah, so what I did was I submitted a Freedom of Information Act request to the EPA to identify uh, what pesticide products the EPA has been approving recently. And so I focused on 2017 and 2018. And the information I got back was pretty crazy. Um, in those two years, the EPA has approved uh, about 1,200 pesticide products for use. It's about 600 per year. Um, and the application approval rate is really high. It's about 94% of all pesticide applications ultimately gain approval. Is that and normal? So when I, uh, and that, that's, that's a good question. That's something I don't know because my analysis is really only uh, tailored to those two years. My mm -hmm. guess is that's pretty normal, actually, from, you know, just from the experience I've had with this agency. Um, it's pretty normal. And so what, what really caught my eye was actually some of the ingredients in the products that were approved. Uh, you know, there were some products that had some really pretty benign ingredients in there, but there were really some, I'd say over 100, that have some of the worst of the worst pesticides still allowed for use in the U.S. And some of these, like you mentioned, are banned in other countries, um, particularly other countries that have a lot of agriculture, like the United States. Um, and so this is worrisome, and it really goes against the EPA's main talking point is that they're constantly trying to progress. They're constantly trying to uh, replace the worst pesticides with others that are less harmful. And, you know, what I really think this finds is that, it, you know, if that's really EPA's intent, then why on earth are they approving products as recently as a year or two ago with some of the worst of the worst pesticides that they've publicly stated that they're trying to replace. Now, I remember some years ago, uh, I, I believe it was 60 Minutes, like a decade or so ago, maybe two decades ago, did a special on atrazine. Maybe, may, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that, this is my, and this is an endocrine disruptor. They were spraying it on apples, as I recall, and that, that report on 60 Minutes actually hurt the Washington State apple business. But that pesticide then I thought was banned, at least, at least across Europe, and was not largely being used here in the United States. I see there's 17 new products with atrazine in it. Am I remembering this correctly? Um, you may be remembering the report correctly, but certainly not atrazine's uh, use in the United States. Atrazine is currently the second most widely used pesticide in the United States behind Whoa. glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. We use about 70 to 80 million pounds of atrazine each year, mostly on corn and sorghum and sugarcane. Uh, it's also used on residential lawns golf courses, athletic fields. What are the like consequences so, of being exposed to atrazine? Well, it really depends on the level that you're exposed to, but um, we know that uh, there are epidemiological studies done in humans associating uh, high atrazine exposure with things like uh, kidney disease, uh, cancer, and reproductive harms like irregular menstrual cycles in women and decreased sperm count in men. And the environmental harms, I would say, are probably even worse, uh, particularly to aquatic organisms like uh, fish and amphibians like frogs and salamanders. Uh, you know, the, the level of atrazine needed to cause reproductive harm to these aquatic species is extremely minuscule, much lower than actually is allowed in our drinking water. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's, it has major environmental implications, and it's a... Uh, one of the most prevalent pesticide water contamin contaminants in the country. And in the last two years, as you mentioned, we, you know, the U.S. EPA has approved 17 new pesticide products containing atrazine, which is really worrisome.
Yeah, it, it truly is. You also note that they that many of the new pesticides that are being rolled out contain multiple active ingredients, but that the FDA does not examine what happens when products when two different chemicals are in the same soup basically you know whether it's additive whether it's synergistic whether it's you know <laughs> disastrous uh, why is that well uh, the EPA which is the the agency in charge of this um, you know it's it's really from a practicality standpoint uh, the the sheer number of uh, mixtures that you can encounter in the environment is really astronomical, mm -hmm. particularly with regards to the permissive labels on a lot of these pesticide products. You can mix them, match them, do whatever with them before you spray them in the field. And when you have a large amount of chemical inputs in, you know, a relatively small amount of land, like happens often in the Midwest and across lots of agricultural regions, you just have all this stuff running off into the lakes and streams, uh, drifting into the air. And so, you know, to really yeah. get a grasp on this is going to require so much more study than we're even capable of doing. So I think, you know, it's more of a practicality standpoint for them, not, to, not really based on on, on a science. robust scientific review. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or practicality or budgets. I mean, you know, it's because it, obviously they could do that research if they had enough, you know, if they ha had enough scientists and, and enough of a budget. Uh, I thought that in 1998, 22 years ago, the EPA started this new program called Reduced Risk. And the goal of it was to uh, basically reduce the risk of these chemicals in our environment. What happened with that? <laughs> Yeah, so that was uh, that sort of came to be right around the time the Food Quality Protection Act was signed into law in 1996. Uh, this increased uh, some safeguards to humans from pesticides, and so the idea was um, to identify really some of the worst classes of pesticides, and then incentivize pesticide companies to come up with replacements to those really really harmful chemicals. And so the idea was that at, over time we would sort of eventually be replacing the worst of the worst pesticides with some that have a better safety profile. Um, I think that that's probably happened to a small extent, um, but a lot of the products that have been approved in the last two years contain these same ingredients that EPA is incentivizing replacement for. So while EPA is incentivizing replacement, it's also approving new products with those ingredients that they're trying to replace. So they're sort of working against themselves and not in you know the best interests of society. Has the FDA become a captured agency you know, like the FCC has? Basically, the FCC dances to the tune of big telecom companies and, and, uh, and big Internet service providers. Is the EPA dancing to the tune of the pesticide industry rather than protecting the public, which is their mandate? Yeah, so the EPA is a really large agency, and it has a lot of different sub-agencies in it. Um, some are worse than the others. Some are, you know, some are good, some are better. Some, but I would say the, the the pesticide office at the EPA is really pretty bad and not reflective of the EPA at large. And a lot of that really comes down to access and the influence of the agrochemical industry. So in the 1980s, U.S. law made it so that pesticide companies have been on the hook for a lot of the costs associated with pesticide regulation and. Uh, in, a, in the early 2000s, with the passage of PREA, which is the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, um, uh, pesticide companies are, are on the hook for about 30 to 40 percent of the salaries, the operating costs of the pesticide office at the EPA. Uh, so the pesticide industry actually loves PREA. And why on earth would they love PREA if it costs them tens of millions of dollars each year? Uh, and it's because it intermingles the regulator and the regulated. That money has bought them a lot of access that most industries don't really have at the EPA. They're in constant communication with each other to the point where the line between the two becomes very blurry. And I think that level of familiarity is really improper and not in alignment with an effective separation of industry and government. Is there also a revolving door problem there? Yeah, absolutely. Where where people uh, working yeah. for the EPA, if they if they dance to the tune of the pesticide industry, they know that they can get a really good paying job when they leave in the in the industry. 
Yeah, and there there have been people that have have documented that. I'm not too familiar with it, but from mm-hmm. what I've heard from people that I trust, there is definitely quite a revolving door there. Yeah, remarkable stuff. Dr. Nathan Donnelly, he is the senior scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity. Biologicaldiversity.org is the website. Uh, Dr. Donnelly, thanks so much for dropping by today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Great talking with you. We'll be back at 16 minutes past the hour here on the Tom Hartman program. Amazing. Amazing. Trump EPA approves 100 plus products with pesticides banned in other countries.